Okay, so it's noon on the nose, and given that we all have an hour together, we're going to get it started. Uh, so first off, um, my name is Lori Drake, and I'm the Director of Research and Learning at Mass LBP, and I'll be your host and the moderator for today's uh, conversation. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us, and, and welcome to um, our event on innovative citizen participation in new democratic institutions. Uh, and I must say that you know one of the one of the things about hosting a webinar online in the middle of July is that when we sent out the invitation, you know we weren't quite sure how many people were going to take us up on the offer to to join us, uh, especially when it's so nice outside, um, at least here in Toronto. Um, but I'm really really excited to see so many people joining us. I'm looking right now; we have close to 100 participants in the room, which is really exciting, and I see more joining. So I think we're going to have a really great, uh, really great crowd, um, and you know it's really exciting to hear everybody's, um, you know, really see everybody's interest in the Canadian launch of the OECD report um, on called Catching the Deliberative Wave, which we're all going to learn more about today. Uh, we have many different people joining us, uh, some from uh, around the world, but a lot of Canadians in the room today. Uh, and you know, for, for the Canadians, I think the last time that they might have heard of a citizens' assembly was probably over a decade ago, uh, when the governments of British Columbia and then subsequently of Ontario hosted uh, citizens' assemblies uh, and brought people together to deliberate on electoral reform. And, and today's event is very much about telling the story of, of really what has happened since then. Uh, and so joining us to talk about this, um, I have four guests, which I'm really excited uh, to be able to, uh, to hear from. Uh, first off is Claudia Hualitz, who is a Canadian, uh, but currently living in Paris um, and working with the OECD, um, leading their Innovative Citizen Participation Group, uh, and also the author of the report that we'll be uh, speaking about today. Uh, we also have with us uh, Leslie Wu, who is the Chief Planning Officer at Metrolinx, um, which is the regional transportation agency um, for the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Uh, we also have Peter McLeod, who is the founder and the principal of MassLBP, one of Canada's leading experts um, in public engagement and deliberative democracy. Uh, and last but not least, we have Karen Fuller, who is the lead uh, for outreach and engagement for open government at the Treasury Board of Canada Secretariat, uh, you know, who's also really interested in, in raising the profile of open government and working to bring more voices and points of view from outside of government into government. So I think we've got a really great group of people here, lots of different perspectives, um, and really excited to hear from all of them. But before I turn the mic over to Claudia, who is going to get everything kicked off um, with a presentation highlighting the report that she has authored, um, I have three housekeeping notes that I want to go over with everyone. So first is, what can you expect in today's webinar? Um, so as I mentioned, Claudia is going to get it started. She'll be speaking to us for about 15 minutes, giving us really the summary, the rundown of her findings. Um, after that, I'll be handing it over to our, our panel. So that includes uh, Peter, Leslie, and Karen, who will each be responding to it and sharing their respective insights with the group. Um, and I've asked them each to speak for about five minutes. So we'll be spending about 15 minutes together in the panel discussion. Um, I'll then kick it back over to Claudia to give her about a minute or two to just you know, reflect on what she heard from the panel. Uh, and then we'll spend the remainder of our time together, which will be approximately 20 minutes. Um, I'll be moderating a Q&A. Uh, and this leads me to my second housekeeping point, which is how to ask your questions. Um, so given that we are a really large group, we're up at about 115 right now, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask, share their questions in the chat. So for those of you who aren't familiar, um, you can find the chat function on the bottom of your screen. If you bring your cursor down and hover over, you will see a kind of um, speaking bubble with the word chat there. You click on that and you'll see uh, it pop up on the side of your screen. 
You can drop your questions in there and I would encourage you to drop your questions in at any point during the conversation. So I'll be checking that throughout the entire event. Um, I know there are a lot of people, so there will probably be a lot of questions. I'm gonna do my best to summarize and group questions together so that we can get through as many, many of them as possible when we get to the Q&A. Um, but don't feel like you have to wait till the Q&A to drop that question in. It'll also help me to start to kind of curate those questions for the panelists and for Claudia as well. Um, and third um, is our hashtag. So if you are interested in tweeting about the event today, um, we will drop the, uh, the hashtag in the chat too, but it is hashtag DelibDem, so D-E-L-I-B-D-E-M. Uh, and you can, uh, no, sorry, I'm, I'm wrong. It's DelibWave, my apologies. So it's hashtag D-E-L-I-B-W-A-V-E. -E, and I'm gonna ask Ruxar to drop that in the chat so that folks can get it right. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Claudia um, to share her, her amazing report um, and her findings with the group. Claudia, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Laurie, for that introduction. And it's really a pleasure to be here today. And even though I'm over in Paris, as you said, I'm here with my fellow compatriots as a Canadian. So there's also something a bit special about this event for me in that sense as well. Um, so my name is Claudia Farish. I'm leading the area of work around innovative citizen participation at the OECD. And what I'm going to talk you through right now are the, the key findings of a big report that I've been working on. Although I do have to say I'm not the only author of this report. I think I, it's fair to recognize my co-author, Yevai Chastinaitite, and it's also been a really collaborative effort actually with the OECD Innovative Citizen Participation Network, which Laurie and Peter and Karen Fuller are also part of. So it's, it's really been a, a bigger effort than that. And I mean, I've played a role in it, but I want to say I'm not the only one. So the report is called Innovative Citizen Participation and New Democratic Institutions Catching Deliberative, the Deliberative Wave. Uh, and what this report focuses on in particular are what we've called representative deliberative processes. Now, it's a little bit of a mouthful. I admit it's a bit of a technical term, but I feel like it's important to be clear about what we're talking about because there's a lot of terminology around democracy, about participation, participatory democracy, deliberative democracy, but here what we have really zoomed in on to better understand are the use of things like citizens assemblies, citizens juries, consensus conferences, planning cells. Um, in, in a nutshell, these are the sorts of democratic processes that bring together a smaller group of randomly selected people who are more or less representative of the wider public. And this group has the time and the resources to be able to hear from a wide range of experts, from a wide range of stakeholders, to deliberate with one another and to find some sense of shared common ground to be able to develop collective and informed recommendations for a public authority on an issue. So they're, they're quite specific. Uh, it's quite a different phenomenon to participatory processes, which I think many people tend to be more familiar with, although it's not necessarily like an either or, or one is better than an other. Quite often these citizens assemblies and juries and reference panels go hand in hand with more participatory practices as well. Now to make all of that sound a bit less abstract, let me just give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about here. Um, examples like the Citizens Reference Panel on Pharmacare in Canada, which I think Peter would be able to tell you a lot more about, but what this was was in October 2016, 35 Canadians from across the country came together for a number of days to deliberate on and come up with recommendations about better models of improving access to prescription drugs. Another example, which you may have heard of, is the Irish Citizens Assembly, which from 2016 to 2018 deliberated on five different topics, one of them being abortion, uh, which there was quite a lot of coverage on because the Citizens Assembly had recommended to the Special Parliamentary Committee that there should be a referendum on the issue to change the constitution, giving concrete recommendations to that parliamentary committee on how the legislation should change if the population votes for change in this referendum. 
Another example that has just come to, to an end a couple of weeks ago is the French Citizens Convention on Climate. Here we've had 150 randomly selected people from all across France from the age of 16 and over who have met numerous times since October last year until June this year to deliberate on how France can lower its greenhouse gas emissions by 40% compared to 1990 levels by 2030 in a way that is socially just. So they've just delivered uh, their 150 recommendations to the government uh, and, now, and now it's up to them to, to act and to respond. So definitely something to follow and to keep an eye on. Uh, and finally, an example from across the world of the Melbourne People's Panel, which in 2014 was initiated by Melbourne City Council to help them um, to help them decide upon what should be the priorities for their 10-year, $5 billion plan. Uh, so a very holistic approach, a more deliberative approach to, to participatory budgeting in some ways. So what all of these examples that I just mentioned have in common, as well as all of the examples that we've looked at in this OECD report, uh, we've come across 289 of them. They all have these three elements in common representativeness, deliberation, and impact. Uh, so representativeness, meaning that participants have been randomly selected and then demographically stratified, meaning uh, that there's been criteria applied to make sure that they are broadly representative of the population when it comes to things like gender, age, geography, um, socioeconomic status. The second point being deliberation, now, this is something that requires time. So we have operationalized this in our study as something, um, as a process that has had at least one full day of face-to-face -face meetings. And the third being impact. So there are lots of these examples that have also been initiated by CSOs, by academia, uh, but what we've zoomed in on here for the OECD study are all the processes that have been commissioned by a public authority that is then able to act and respond on to the recommendations that come out of it at the end. Now, some of you may be thinking, okay, but why is the OECD interested in, in, these, in these principles of representativeness and deliberation, of representative deliberative processes like citizens' assemblies? Um, well, the, our institution focuses by, by gathering data and evidence and off of the back of that, developing non-binding legal instruments, which are called recommendations. And so in 2017, the OECD issued a recommendation of the Council on Open Government, uh, which has two provisions that focus more specifically on stakeholder participation and in our legal language citizens are defined as a type of stakeholder um, so in in this recommendation there are two provisions which focus specifically emphasizing the importance of having equal and fair opportunities to be informed and consulted and actively engaged in all phases of the policy cycle uh, and also putting emphasis on promoting innovative ways to effectively engage with stakeholders to source ideas and to co-create solutions so essentially this is all saying to really move beyond more traditional consultation approaches that can be top down that can still be led very much by government that aren't doing that aren't really moving things yet in that direction of changing the relationship between citizens and government and really thinking about how can we how can we do citizen participation in a better way where the outcomes are, are informed recommendations from, that are uh, issued from a more inclusive process um, where a broader set of voices can be heard. So keeping these criteria in mind, representative deliberative processes are definitely not the only way to do this, of course, but definitely one of the most prominent ways of helping to achieve these ultimate aims of the OECD recommendation. Now, beyond this, in doing the research for this report, there was also quite a lot of, of other reasons why representativeness and deliberation coming together have certain benefits when it comes to improving policy making and public decision making. So the first being that because of the way it's designed, it helps lead to better policy outcomes because deliberation ends up resulting in public judgments rather than just public opinions. Secondly, uh, it allows public decision makers to have greater legitimacy to make hard choices because they're able to say that they've had this tough problem, but they've put it to a representative group of people. They've given those people the time and the resources to be able to come to informed recommendations and then have a chance to, to listen to, to those recommendations and to act on them. 
Uh, the third is that there is a potential to enhance public trust in government and democratic institutions more broadly by giving citizens an effective role in public decision making. Uh, these processes also signal civic respect and they empower citizens. They make governance more inclusive because they're opening the door to a more representative group of people than typically participates, either, either if we look at our, at our parliaments or if we look at more open types of participation processes. Um, sixth, uh, they have a potential to also strengthen integrity and prevent corruption by ensuring that the groups and the individuals with money and power can't have undue influence on a public decision. They have to go through the same transparent and fair process of being heard as a stakeholder with their, um, with their evidence also being available to the wider public in these representative deliberative processes. Uh, and finally, um, this is an emerging field of research, but still the research at the moment is pointing in the direction that the use of these processes on contentious issues are also have the possibility of helping counteract polarization and disinformation. But beyond these reasons, there's also another reason why we've, we've been looking at the OECD at representative deliberative processes now, as in, in 2020, in 2019, when we started this research. And that's because um, we really had a sense that there was just an increasing use of these kinds of processes by governments across the world without having this comprehensive analysis about, you know, what has been happening, where and how, what are the good practice principles that should be underpinning this. And so once we start collecting the data, we, this was really this kind of hypothesis that there had, has been a wave building has been born out in it. Um, so here I'm showing a graph about the, the, the 289 cases that we've collected. Um, so as I mentioned, all of these cases have those three criteria in common of representativeness, deliberation and impact. Uh, and there was no cutoff date in terms of start uh, time. There was a cutoff date of October 2019 of when uh, an example had to be finished uh, so that for comparability reasons you know all of the all of the examples were at the same stage and at one point we just had to stop and actually do the data analysis and write the report because there's still a lot going on today um, and actually that makes me bring up the point that that line for 2019, uh, even though it's not the highest, actually, we had counted another 30 to 40 processes on top of that, that were either underway or announced when we had to cut off the data collection. So actually, that line for 2019, if we were able to include all of those would be twice as high and literally off the charts compared to, to the other years. So we see there was an initial wave around the early 2000s, a second wave building since 2010. And really, at this point, it's like, turning into a tsunami and the question is really like what happens next and this is where we hope that some of this analysis and also the OEC's good practice principles can can be helpful and useful. Uh, so where did we find all of these cases? Uh, we had a pretty rigorous and intensive seven month data collection process trying to look as broadly as we could. And we, we found cases really in, in 18 different countries and in addition to the EU international level. Um, so a small caveat to say that, you know, we can't be certain 100% that this is every single case that took place between 1986 and, and today, we can be certain that it's been the most exhaustive search that, that it's been possible, but there have been certain, uh, certain language and other barriers to, to finding this research. But nonetheless, I have to say that we were, we were somewhat surprised even by how many examples that we, we found um, happening all over the place. And as you can see from this graph too, Canada in many ways has actually been a, a leader and a pioneer in the use of these processes. So I'd say that Germany, Australia, Canada, Denmark are some of the countries that kind of end up coining some of what are considered different deliberative models. Um, so without going into too many technical details now, in, in Germany, uh, there's a specific form of these processes, which is called the planning cell, which is really popular. Uh, in Australia, there have been a lot of citizens juries. Uh, in Canada, um, the, the original citizens assemblies took place and Mass LBP has been pioneering the use of the reference panel. In Denmark, uh, the consensus conference has has been really popular. Uh, so there's a little bit of a correlation between the development of these models and the number of examples we've seen in different countries over, over time. 
Now, I should have mentioned actually perhaps from the start, but these examples, the 289 of them, are at all levels of government. So we were looking at, from the local also to the supranational. Uh, so around half of the examples are, are local level, 30% are from the regional state level, 15% from the national level, and 3% at the international level. Uh, and a small caveat that actually the, the regional and state examples are almost entirely from Canada and Australia. And I don't think I need to tell this audience that because you're a very federal country, a lot of those issues would have been considered national level issues in Europe. Uh, so something to consider, because I think sometimes there's a little bit of a myth that this is only for the local level, uh, but actually we've seen a, a very wide range of, um, of different practices at all levels of government. Now, what sorts of issues have, have been addressed using deliberative processes like citizens' assemblies and reference panels? Uh, there's quite a wide range. It differs a little bit depending on the level of government, but overall, the most popular types of problems, public problems, have been urban planning, health, environment, strategic planning, and infrastructure. Um, but in some ways, it's almost more useful to think about like what, what types of problems have been well suited to being addressed using these types of representative deliberative processes. Uh, so the way we approached it um, through the analysis and also looking at the literature and talking to practitioners is that there are certain types of public problems that are, are better suited to this kind of approach. Um, those being uh, values-driven dilemmas, um, long-term problems that go beyond the short-term incentives of elections, and also complex problems that require the weighing of trade-offs. So they're not well suited if there's only one or two options on the table and it's a yes or no, or um, you know, if there's more of a binary choice. They're not well suited if, if the options are really limited or if a decision has almost been taken. Um, but there are many problems out there where uh, there's still numerous ways forward that are technically right. And it's about identifying the priorities in the community and trying to find the common ground uh, when there's uh, some contentious points around them. So they've been really used in a lot of situations when there, where there's been some political deadlock uh, to help unlock action on, on certain types of problems. Uh, now, I won't go into this part too in depth because of time, but I'm happy to answer questions about this if that comes through in the chat. Uh, but off of the back of this extensive data analysis and also working together with an advisory group of, of experts that were a mix of practitioners, of civil servants, of academics, um, which also included Peter McLeod, actually. Uh, we developed the OECD Good Practice Principles for Deliberative Processes for Public Decision Making. So we really hope that these will be useful for both uh, policymakers who are considering uh, implementing or, or initiating these types of uh, processes, and also for practitioners uh, who, who are putting them into action. Now, finally, ooh, I see there's a... <laughs> a little bit of a red uh, reflection from my screen there. Um, but what we, what we also looked at is beyond these individual examples, thinking a little bit about the bigger picture and the next steps of, of where we're seeing some of the trends with these processes too. Because, um, you know, uh, most of these examples are of one-off processes, which have been very much dependent in some cases on the political will of the initiator, whether that's a politician or a senior civil servant. Um, but there's also a few examples of the institutionalization of public deliberation to become more a part of the normal part of the way public decisions are taken and thinking a bit more, more ambitiously about what we want our future democratic institutions to look like. Um, so in this report, we considered the different reasons about you know, why, why institutionalization is something to consider in the first place. Now, I think you can take a lot of those um, six points that I mentioned earlier about why deliberation and in addition to those, um, there's some specific reasons why there are additional benefits to, to embedding this into how public decisions are taken. Um, so the first one being, I just described the types of problems that are well suited to public deliberation. They're the really hard problems. Um, so by institutionalizing the use of deliberation for those types of problems, naturally it would allow public decision makers to be able to take more of those types of hard decisions. 
Secondly, by creating the infrastructure permanently in place, uh, it would allow uh, deliberation to be conducted more, more efficiently and, and less expensively as well, because you're not starting from scratch every single time uh, to, to, put that, uh, to put that infrastructure in place around doing the random selection, around knowing how to design an agenda, around having the competencies for facilitation and so on. Third uh, is, I think it's really only with institutionalization that there's the greatest potential to enhance public trust so of course i think there are some some potentials and benefits even with the one-off processes so i'm not saying that should be discounted but if we're talking about the long-term bigger societal change in terms of the the trust in both directions between citizens and government um, i think it's only when it becomes more of a regular and ongoing part of our democracies that we all also have responsibilities that perhaps you know once or twice in our lives or we know someone who plays a more meaningful role in fulfilling their civic duties to participate more directly in shaping public decisions that are affecting their lives in between elections every few years um, fourth, uh, is that through institutionalization, there's a potential to enrich democracy by expanding meaningful citizen participation uh, to a much wider and also much more diverse group of people uh, than normally participates, whether that's through elections to become our elected representatives or whether that's through participatory processes which are open to everyone, but which we know a lot of research shows um, tends to involve more of people who are well-educated, well-off, urban uh, male, not exactly reflective of a broader society. Um, and fifth is that these opportunities to participate in it in such a meaningful way really uh, strengthen the civic capacity of citizens and by creating ongoing opportunities for more and more citizens to be able to play those roles, um, there's a chance to really strengthen that, that democratic fitness of society and to feel those benefits on a, on a larger scale than we have so far. So very briefly, because I'm coming to the end of my time, we looked at uh, three different approaches to institutionalization so far. Uh, so one being a permanent or ongoing structure for representative citizen deliberation. And I'll give you very, one very brief example of that. Uh, second is requirements for organizing representative deliberative processes under certain conditions. Uh, so this can be, for example, if there's a if there's an infrastructure project of a certain cost, there might be a, a requirement to first have a public deliberation before all the final decisions can be taken. And then third being rules allowing citizens to demand a representative deliberative process on a specific issue. Uh, so often we think of this in terms of the number of, of signatures required. Usually this happens for referendums, but there's a few examples in different Polish cities and also the Austrian state of Vorarlberg um, where this has been the case uh, for them to initiate a citizens council. Um, so just to, to, to end on this, I wanted to give you an example of, of how, what one form of institutionalization that has taken the form of the Ostbelgian model, and Ostbelgian is the German-speaking community of Belgium, um, where as of last year, they've established this new institution called the Citizens Council, uh, which is 24 randomly selected citizens who have two roles, two main roles, one being agenda setting, it's up to them to decide what should be the issues that are put to different citizens panels, um, each citizens panel also being a deliberative process with randomly selected citizens. Uh, and in the legislation, the parliament is required to have at least two debates about those recommendations that come from each citizens panel. So the second role of the citizens council is to monitor that this is actually taking place. Um, now, things have been a bit delayed because of the whole coronavirus crisis. Uh, I think, quite funnily enough, uh, the, the citizens had chosen the topic of how to improve the conditions of healthcare workers as the topic of the first citizens panel back last autumn before this had become an issue. So you can say that they were preemptive in, in many ways. And I think another example of why you can trust your citizens to <laughs> take the initiative. Uh, but again, something to, to keep an eye on. So I will leave it there. I look forward to hearing from the other panelists and also to, to answering all of your questions. So thank you very much. Great. Thank
thank you so much, Claudia, for doing such an excellent job of summarizing um, what is actually a very lengthy report if folks have not had the chance to look at it in, in such an eloquent and succinct way. So, so thank you uh, again for that. So I'm going to actually um, move us along to the panel discussion now. Um, and so in order to kick us off, I'm going to actually turn to Peter first to kick off the conversation. Um, you know, given that he's been watching this wave take place over the past decade or so in Canada, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Leslie, um, who has worked um, with deliberative processes in her role at Metrolinx. Um, and finally, I'll turn it over to Karen, um, who can share also some insights about how we can build off of this report as well. So Peter, uh, over to you. All right, well, thanks, Laurie. And again, thanks everyone for making the time to join us. And, and especially, you know, kudos to Claudia and the team at the OECD. I think this is a really important, it's, it's a landmark report. And for those who don't even know maybe the backstory of why it's called the deliberative wave, you know, this is sort of the, the next generation beyond the deliberative turn that took place in democratic theory in 1990s. And I think your report does such a good job illustrating the progression of how jurisdictions have been learning from one another and building upon different kinds of precedents. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really tempted to dive in and try and, and respond to these terrific questions that are uh, appearing in the chat section. Uh, I think it points to the need to, to probably organize some sort of workshop to deal with uh, all of these thoughtful questions when we have the, the benefit of more time. The point that I wanna make right now is to kind of pick up on the story uh, that for Canadians did leave off in 2006 with the Ontario Citizens Assembly and electoral reform. And, you know, it, it, it is very much the case that Canada, along with Australia and Germany and Denmark, has been a leader in, in trying to advance really a, a community of practice. And perhaps one of the things you're noticing is all the different shapes and sizes that these representative deliberative processes uh, uh, can can take. There's, the, there's a real range of, of formats, but they share some consistent principles. And the story here in Canada is, well, what are these kind of 40 processes that have happened since we last looked at electoral reform? Just to add a couple numbers to this, it means that approximately 1,400 Canadians have had the opportunity to serve on processes like those that Claudia is describing. And, and as we count it, it adds up to something on the order of 56,000 hours uh, volunteer citizen time that has been invested in dealing with some of the thorny issues that, that Claudia has been pointing to. Um, absolutely, the Canadian Reference Panel on, on Pharmacare is one example. We can look to the BC government, which um, asked for uh, very thoughtful advice from a range of randomly selected citizens when they're developing privacy protocols for its service card. We can look uh, to Vancouver that dealt with a, a particularly uh, challenging set of local land use uh, issues in a neighborhood called Grandview Woodland. We can look here to Ontario, uh, where its health system, both at the regional level and provincially, has impaneled citizens uh, to advise it on everything from health service prioritization to the introduction of supervised injection services here in Toronto. Uh, so there's, if, if you're coming to this work um, perhaps for the first time, uh, rest assured that even though this report describes these practices as innovative, in fact, now we can dig into a really deep body of evidence and understand better when these processes can be most successful and how we can learn from one another. You know, one of the things that I think is, is appealing about representative deliberative processes is that, you know, they, they not only help decision makers, take tough choices, but they pay out a kind of democratic dividend. And that's a phrase that we like to use because it points to the fact that, you know, citizens involved in these processes come to appreciate some of the complexity that public servants are always grappling with. We find that for those participants, the experience of serving on an assembly or a reference panel um, cultivates a kind of empathy um, an appreciation for the needs of strangers, uh, for people whose needs are very different than their own. Um, and that in doing so, it helps to cultivate a kind of a sense of mutual respect. And I think these things are important to highlight right now because of course, 
societies around the world are, are grappling with the tensions produced by increased polarization. And I think that polarization is exacerbated by the fact that we rarely have the chance to, to sit together, to hear from one another directly. And, and so that I, that I feel is perhaps one of the reasons why these processes are, are maybe uh, becoming more mainstream right now, is that we're looking for ways to connect and to overcome some of these divides. I think it's also the case that you know, more traditional approaches to public consultation have, have real limitations. And, and these are known to, I think, everyone on the call. Um, you know, too much of what passes for public consultation is really about perpetuating a politics of preferences. Do we like it? Do we not like it? With everybody kind of voting their interests. And one of the ways that I've come to understand this work is to think about it instead as a politics of problem solving. That we're asking people to grapple with these choices and to try and solve a problem with us. But the challenge for public servants then and for governments and political leaders is that they have to actually be willing to frame the issue as a problem that lends itself to public dialogue and to be open, of course, to a range of, of different outcomes. And maybe that's something we can discuss more in the, the Q&A section. The last point I think I'd like to make is that, you know, if it is a politics of problem solving, um, then of course we do need to make sure that people have good information with which to solve the problem. And, and again, this also poses a challenge to some of our typical ways of doing business. It means that we have to share the whole case, right? And that we can't only tell our side of it, but that we need to include opposing uh, voices that, that people need to be able to hear from a range of perspectives so that they can come to an informed view and, and their, their own understanding of the issue. And, and that's why I think you know, um, public engagement deliberative public engagement and public learning are so closely intertwined. They're flip sides of the same coin. And so thinking about the pedagogy that um, supports these processes, thinking about the curriculum that has to be developed uh, to support these processes and doing it in such a way that doesn't introduce bias that um, it can be seen as credible and impartial is such a key component of, of allowing these processes to be effective and ultimately to succeed. Anyway, those are just a, a, a few observations that I, I wanted to make uh, about how we differentiate this work from more conventional approaches. Um, I, I wanna say as well that I, I don't think citizens assemblies and reference panels are the solution to every uh, public consultation problem. I think Cloudy has done a very good job defining the kind of category of issues in which they're most effective. But at their best, they actually sit within a wider range of processes that can reach out beyond the 36 or the 64 or the 110 people who might participate. So this is a new tool in the toolbox, one that we're seeing in other jurisdictions. And I'm delighted that Leslie is able to, to be here to give us a couple of examples of the difference that's made at Metrolinx. Thanks, Peter. And um, it's great to be here. Wonderful to join the group. and. It's interesting, um, I think in many respects, the way I come at this is, is it's almost, it's incredibly practical in terms of our choices and decisions. But let me tell you a little bit about Metrolinx. We're the regional transportation authority um, for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. This is a region um, in, Toronto, in, a, in and around Toronto that today is home to about 7.8 million people and growing. We expect by 2041, there'll be 10 million people here there's 110,000 people a year, uh, uh, new people that come to this region to call it home. And so, um, you know, we're in the business of transit. We operate uh, a, a commuter uh, bus and rail system that is evolving. We are um, basically managing and directing the largest transit expansion in, uh, in Canadian history, possibly in North America. It's about a $60 billion um, transit expansion in subways, LRTs, bus rapid transit. Uh, we're electrifying our uh, five of our seven uh, Grove Rail corridors. And, um, and we are, um, our customers, our clients, our stakeholders are in one of the most diverse regions and cities in the world, in Toronto. And um, so you could, imagine uh, that um, there are many opinions, views, uh, and multiple decisions at the local level 
um, at the in terms of when and how to prioritize investments, in terms of what policy directions to seek. Uh, but to understand why we became involved with uh, um, working this way and with Peter and his group is to understand to a certain degree my own um, history uh, in public engagement, which prior to Metrolinks, uh, I had been involved and have been involved in num numerous large scale uh, um, planning pr um, endeavors like the growth management uh, uh, plan that we came upon and possibly tried every possible human method of engaging. Town halls, stakeholder forums, workshops, one-on-ones, uh, all kinds of ways to really um, uh, bring to light um, and understand the ability of uh, the views and, vo and voices of others. And I think one of the things, which is really a practical thing, when faced with the 12 years ago, asked to create the regional transportation plan for Metrolinx, was uh, we trying to understand and seeing the limitations of town halls where, you know, the loudest voice or in many respects, uh, having spent time on the community development side and being part of an advocacy group early in my career, understanding that I'd look around at these meetings and it would be the profile of the people attending were quite uniform. They were generally people that had lots of time on their hands. Um, so students as I was um, in the space or seniors and trying to really um, figure out how that inherent bias is, which is built into more traditional methods of engagement could be expanded. So, um, when we, uh, you know, looked up, uh, at thinking about our first plan, we adopted many, many, many different ways, including online methods and so forth that we experimented with. But when we had to come around to our second um, version of the plan, pardon the noise behind, uh, our second version of the plan, uh, we reached out to Peter and MassLab and the group to, you know, I had heard about Citizen Assembly. Um, I had uh, read about its effectiveness in Australia. And I think one of the most important things I would say, I am a believer that broad and diverse engagement will result in better policy. And so one of the things I wanna talk about is the, uh, the, the, the importance of the need of champions who actually believe, and especially in the public sector, that it is okay to not necessarily know the exact outcome of a citizen panel, but believe that it will embellish, enhance, and inform the outcome, and to not be afraid of the outcome. I think that is one of the big barriers to adopting this method uh, that public officials have and elected re representatives have, the inability to control the outcome. Um, but you, so, I, but I think, you know, I, in many respects, I'm a believer that the process will point us in the right direction. For our regional transportation plan, the uh, citizen uh, reference panel was deliberating in parallel with our development of the plan. And so it wasn't a matter that we waited for them to deliberate and then inform and then put that into the plan. We were actually informing the plan as the conversation with the citizen panel was emerging. And I think the thing that was really important for us is that because, right, you know, the region is composed of 75% uh, non-transit users, so automobile users mostly, trying to understand how we would have what I would call, what I refer to as a durable plan that had a, a, a champion, a voice of champions that was a, as diverse, including uh, auto users for a plan that's primarily about transit. And so the business we're in, the, the scale of the capital programs, in order to deliver on them, doesn't just happen in one year or two years. It doesn't happen over one term of government. It happens over several terms of government. You don't build a subway in two or three years. You don't build uh, or change uh, you know, from diesel to electric in a short space of time. So the importance of having a durable plan, which meant, therefore, we had to have a constituency uh, who were champion the plan and as broad as possible over an extended period. And I think that's one of the be benefits of the Citizen Assembly. And that has continued to be one of the benefits uh, in terms of how we are now expanded the, um, 
the 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 the, the idea of citizen is assembly into more of a standing group. Uh, once we had completed the plan and we were successfully able to actually uh, demonstrate how the citizens panel report was directly reflected in the kind of principles that we embodied in our plan, which included other methods of input, um, um, municipalities, other stakeholders, and so forth. And there was a convergence there. The next round is really about giving advice on the delivery of the plan, the implementation, the more tactile on the ground work that we're doing to go from broad policy into actual construction, um, customer service, and so forth. And so now we've taken it to another level. I think the, before I, just before I end, I think one of the things, there are two things I'd want to point out. This concept of institutionalization, I think is more, from my lens, is the place where it will be much more challenging um, in the sense that under, you know, the, the emergence of our use of citizen uh, and different types of citizen assembly was in a direct uh, response to a direct problem with an explicit product at the end. When you have to deal with something in an ongoing way, I, I suspect it will be a lot more challenging. And finally, I think the, the, only, the other thing I take away, first of all, the people that we met in the assemblies were amazing, wonderful, insightful, able to articulate the work we're doing in ways and words that we never would have been able to. And also, in a selfish way, we, ha I, we now had, and my staff now had, a group of people who understood what it was like to walk a mile in our shoes. And for whatever reason, that made us also be more um, uh, driven in our mission. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Karen. Thanks so much, Leslie. Uh, I'll, be, I'll try to be as quick as possible because I'm seeing so many great questions that I'd rather talk about than what I have to say. <laughs> Although I have wonderful notes and I'll skip through them very, very quickly. First, I just really wanted to acknowledge and honor the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people, which is where I'm standing or sitting, I guess I'm sitting today. Uh, but I just wanted to make that little acknowledgement, um, which is something we do when we do engagement and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's good practice, as we say, as practitioners. Um, um, you know, my name is Karen Fuller. I lead the Open Government Outreach and Engagement Team here at the Government of Canada. Um, our team works with stakeholders across the federal government as well as with provincial, territorial, and local governments. And we champion um, and advance the public release of data and information. So we're all about transparency, responsive government. We engage with the public. Um, we do ongoing communication and, and types of consultations. Deliberation is, is not really something we've had a chance to explore yet, but it's something we're really interested in tracking and we think it's very kind of on brand with the sort of work that we do. Um, we also have a multi-stakeholder forum, so we do have a sort of somewhat representative body in the open government world. It's a permanent dialogue mechanism uh, that has representatives from both uh, different areas of the federal government and Canadian civil society organizations. So I guess what I'm saying is we prioritize participation. Um, I'm gonna jump really quickly and sorry, Lauren, because you made me so many great notes to keep my thoughts together, but I'm gonna go really fast here. Um, I'm supposed to talk about what the future is for this. And it's a really, really interesting question. And I see a lot of questions in the chat kind of leading us down, you know, the idea of what do we do in the, the way the world is right now? How can we convene these sorts of things? And what are the opportunities? Um, and so I'd like to explore really quickly three points. Um, the first one is why deliberation is important for the public service. And I think a lot of people who are on this call have already been sold that bill of goods and, they, and they've already bought into it. So I won't you know, um, belabor it. With the pandemic aside, we were already in a dynamic space uh, in terms of information sharing and public participation. And I know at the federal level, as well as with our colleagues um, at other levels of government here in Canada, policymakers are really looking for tools and methods that will help them to prioritize and make hard decisions. We all have a lot of hard decisions to make. Uh, and there will be, there are trade-offs. So we need to discuss that with people because it's, it's Canadians governments, not our government. Um, deliberation is a great way to enhance the public's trust in the institutions and 
at a time like this, uh, when we're somewhat locked down and where some of our freedoms are being curtailed, it's, it's, it's more important than ever that people believe in what the government is trying to do and trying to support. Um, and so we're looking to support better and legitimate, more legitimate outcomes in the eyes of citizens and in stakeholder organizations. Oh, skipping ahead, let's see. I would ju I'll would just mention, um, because I know I have some Privy Council Office um, friends on the line here today as well, I saw some questions, uh, that deliberation aligns well with the engagement principles that we champion in our office and in the Government of Canada. They were co-developed by the Open Government team here at the Treasury Board Secretariat, as well as with our um, colleagues at the Privy Council Office. So we have principles that are based on transparency, relevancy, inclusivity, accountability, and adaptability. Uh, these, these are posted and I can share them, or Lauren, who's on the line here and who is the master of all information, mistress of all information, uh, can, can share those with you. If, if you're interested, we did work um, collaboratively to develop those with uh, a variety of um, practitioners in the Government of Canada. So the second question really fast is, how can we move the findings of this report into the activities that we as public servants are doing? Uh, we're always looking for uh, ways to help each other deliver really important mandates and in, in, in difficult times and with you know not as much money as we would like to have in order to, to make things as participatory as we would like. So, and also how can we brief up to our senior management to get the license to do the things that we know are important and that need to be done because deliberation in particular is kind of like a time heavy and a somewhat cost heavy um, activity to do properly. Uh, there's two sections in this report that I'll just highlight really quickly for folks that are, we feel are going to be helpful for our briefing and for our kind of sales pitch that we need to do to get the license to go ahead and do our work. The first is the section on trends, which is chapter three of the report. So this report is concluding that the interest in representative deliberative processes has been increasing across OECD member countries. These are things that we can use for our senior management to say, look, we, we need to keep up. We need to... Uh, you know, do what other countries that we that we are aligned with are, are doing. Um, so this is where we can look to justify where the opportunities may exist in Canada. The second part of the report uh, that I'll highlight is the section on principles, which is chapter five. I believe Claudia showed a slide. It looked kind of like honeycombs uh, that sort of gave some principles. Uh, public servants love principles. They love to ground things in concepts and tenets. So uh, like we are always looking for innovative and, and sort of collaborative ways to kind of institutionalize things that we organically feel are true. Because organically feeling something is true is not really uh, going to get your briefing note approved, if I can put it that coldly. <laughs> um, so uh, we really would recommend folks take a look at the report if you haven't had a chance to yet. The third question, super, super fast, oh my God, I'm still taking too much time, is uh, how do we champion and expand the values that are enshrined in this report? So within the Federal Public Service, we know and we've heard today that um, deliberation is not new, but it's, it's a method that hasn't received the same level of uh, exposure at the f that it has at a more local or regional level and sometimes that has to do as well with like the issues that are, are being discussed because people live locally and so they 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 want to participate in things that really matter to them in their communities and, and we're just a little bit removed from that except in terms of things like health um, pro health Canada has done work even since the early 2000s uh, they had consultation processes relating to food safety and health products that use these sorts of uh, techniques. Um, and there's also a, a journal article that we can share with folks if you're interested from 2005 from Public Sector Innovation that talked about uh, citizen engagement at Health Canada, which outlined support for deliberative forums, specifically noting key value as the mechanism to obtain citizen input on strategic directions and priorities. This is super government speaky, but it, it would get you where you needed to go if you wanted to um, be able to talk to citizens a little bit more conversationally about work that you're doing and to make sure that your policy or your programs are actually aligning with citizen needs and interests. Um, I'm gonna skip, I think everything else and just say thanks so much for having me here today. I'm so sorry we don't have much time to talk, but maybe we can stay a little bit longer. Um, and. Uh, 
you can probably get our contact information from folks, especially in the federal government. You know most of us, but uh, definitely do reach out if, uh, if you want to have a further conversation, just more at sort of like, what are we doing from the center? Thank Great. you. Thank you so much, Karen, Leslie, and Peter for those excellent remarks. Um, I'm going to jump right into the questions because um, there have been a number and I'm going to try and do a good job kind of consolidating a few and I'm, I think I want to kick us off actually with um, a few questions that I've been seeing that I would group together. So there's been a number of questions around impact um, and positioning. And I think what folks are really getting at here is, you know, how do we encourage people in positions of authority and positions of power, be they political or on the public service side, to want to um, start a process like this? And how do we make sure that the recommendations that come out of them are listened to? Um, and this to me is also linked up with a series of questions that I've been seeing here around framing, what we name these processes. And there was a great question about task forces and the names of it. Uh, and so I'm going to, uh, I guess, ping both Leslie and Claudia for this one. Um, Leslie, given your experience, you know, working with these, um, you know, kind of your insight on, you know, how to get people excited about this and, and get them listening to those recommendations, that fear point you were talking about, I think is really important. And Claudia, to you, um, to maybe tackle how, how we frame this, the words we use, the kind of tasks we give citizens and how um, that might be a way to bring politicians and public servants into the conversation and to, to feel comfortable, um, you know, delegating um, this type of responsibility uh, out to citizens. Unmute. I think um, maybe, like I said, I think I'm fairly practical about these issues and, and, and I would never convene a group like this for the sake of convening a group like this. Um, uh, I think it's really important to understand what is the problem statement or the issue that you actually want to have an opinion or a view or a range of views uh, to help you um, solve a problem understand a problem better, identify solutions, um, sort of a, toss, a, a safe place to, stop, to toss things around. And, and without that, it, 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 to, in my mind, it's like window dressing or a checkbox because someone said I need to talk to a lot of interesting people. So for us, it really has to be driven by a desire to seek an outcome for something specific, whether it's a policy, a project, um, you know, it could be a national policy, it could be a local policy, but it needs to be very, very clear in its edges. Uh, otherwise, um, the people that are going to, it's going to be frustrated for the people who participate. So that's number one. And I, and I just think for elected representatives or government officials, you actually have to believe that what you're going to, the conversations you're going to have are ones you want to keep uh, and document and um, uh, embraced even when they don't they aren't going in the direction that you're thinking it should go and and, uh, and that would be my advice because otherwise um, this is all really interesting but not necessarily uh, going to advance us very much great thank you Leslie uh, Claudia would you like to comment a bit around kind of what what what's in a name what we call these things I know your report touches on the many different names internationally that are used to describe these processes and how that also maybe shapes how politicians civil servants even members of the public perceive um, these processes mm, it's true I mean it sounds like a kind of technical thing but there's been a huge debate around this between practitioners and and also academics around what do we call these things because it's true that in certain countries and in certain places uh, some have tended to call the same thing a citizens assembly and other places a citizens jury and and so on in the report we actually identified 12 distinct different kinds of models of deliberative processes which is also to show that you know it's more than just the citizens assembly that exists or if like where you're living you've only heard of planning cells it's more than just that that exists there's different ways that you can still fulfill the same overarching principles um and i think at the end of the day you could probably call it a few different things and what really matters a lot more it, it are those underpinning good practice principles and also 
as Leslie was saying, that they're being used not for the sake of being innovative or for the sake of doing participation, but because they're being used to help solve a problem. That's also something that we try to, to really hit home with public servants when we talk about this too, that what is your hardest problem? It should be the starting point for thinking about, about this. Great, thank you. Uh, I also just wanna make a quick announcement that I've um, quietly over Zoom spoken with all of our guests and they're everyone is able to stay a little bit longer. So I know that we um, had said that this would end at one, but given the number of really interesting questions in the conversation, um, we're gonna just go a little bit over time, probably an extra 10 minutes. So if folks do wanna stick around, please do. And we're gonna continue discussing. If you do have to go, that's okay. Um, and uh, you know, I'll just say thanks um, if you do have to leave for joining us. Um, but I'm going to move us on to some, some other questions here. Um, you know, one of the questions, um, a number of questions actually have uh, been dealing with um, essentially the issue of recruitment. Um, and embedded in there is, you know, some questions around how, how do you actually get a representative group of people in a room together? How does that work? Um, there's also been a number of questions around removing barriers and making sure that folks are able to participate. Because, um, you know, if anybody who's worked in the, in the participation space will know that there are often many things that get in the way and sometimes they're really easy to see and sometimes they're really hard for us to see. Um, you know, and there's also been a number of questions about incentives and how do we get people to show up? Um, you know, what's, how do we actually motivate them? Are people maybe as apathetic as we think they are? Um, will they, you know, when we send out the letters, will they, will they kind of, will they show up on that first Saturday? Um, so I'm going to ask um, both Peter um, and Leslie to tackle those two questions. You know, Peter, um, to maybe talk a little bit about the, the recruitment process um, and maybe point people to some resources um, for further learning. And Leslie, to maybe talk a little bit about, you know, kind of your experience also, you know, getting those people in the room and, and your sense of people's willingness to show up. Um, thanks, Laurie. You know, uh, the process that get is used for these uh, deliberative exercises is technically called sortition and we tried to popularize the term civic lotteries and those who are interested can find a whole guide to how to run it properly. You know, it, it surprises people to know uh, that when you send out letters, generally on brown manila paper, so that looks a little bit like a tax form, uh, and you ask people not whether you're going to come out for 90 minutes or you're going to fill out a survey, but are you willing to give up four or five or six Saturdays of your time? You can reliably expect somewhere between five and 7% of the respondents of those letters to actually volunteer. And immediately, I think because we walk around with so many assumptions about the public and its motivations, we think, well, those are all the keeners or those are just the people who care about that particular issue. In our experience, that is not at all the case. Um, you end up um, uh, having volunteers come from every conceivable walk of life and the motivations behind their desire to get involved um, span a very wide gamut from wanting the chance to give something back, wanting to give someone a piece of their mind, wanting to learn something new, wanting to connect with their community. And I think those, the, those range of motivations are, are really healthy. Um, but again, we need to get past this tyranny of low expectations that tells us implicitly that, oh, well, people are too busy, people are too apathetic, they're not interested. Only other point I'd make is that it is not the case that citizens want to spend all of their time deliberating, right? Uh, instead, we've discovered that people want to engage intensively and episodically. So maybe this is something that you do once or twice in your life. Um, but to give everyone the opportunity to say yes, even once in their life, we need to do a lot to scale this work up. And that's why we find working with agencies like Metrolinx and all kinds of different regulatory questions as interesting as as important as some of those large constitutional issues you see being tackled in countries like Ireland and France. I think the only thing I would add uh... Uh, was 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 kind of my reaction when we first uh, did the lottery, and I was very apprehensive. I was like, you know, who's going to give up five Saturdays in the warm weather? And I was actually blown away, first of all, by the dedication 
the commitment because I thought, well, people will come and by the second week they'll drop off or the third week they drop off. The sustained interest for all the different reasons. There's no one reason why people came to that table. For all different reasons, which is what was so magical about our um, residents reference panel. And what's even more interesting is the culture that they cre created amongst themselves and uh, the network they created for themselves, which actually extended beyond, and I think still continues to a lesser degree, uh, beyond the term of which they were de deliberating. And I think that, I mean, when we think about uh, what we do at, uh, in our organization, in my mind, that ha has many more bonuses than just, did we get a good plan? Great, thank you. Um, we have a series of questions here um, that actually I think have to do with the issue of trust, information, and expertise that I, I'm going to kind of lump together. Um, and to kind of maybe consolidate a few questions into um, one is, is essentially, you know, people are looking for some comments and some advice on you know, how to build that curriculum, right? We know, all know it's part of a deliberative process. Peter spoke about it, uh, Leslie and, and Claudia, you guys also all spoke about the importance of this being part of the, the process and what distinguishes it. But you know, how do we make sure that folks are hearing from the same people? How do we, or not so the same people, from different people, from different perspectives, it's the opposite of what we wanna do. Um, and how do we make sure that folks trust the perspectives that they're hearing from um, and also, how do we allow citizens to also perhaps shape um, the types of perspectives that they're hearing from as well? Um, rather, you know, like, so basically who gets to choose what gets, gets known? Um, so I'm actually going to ask, I'm gonna tag team a few of you to do this. Claudia, I know that this is something that you know about and know how different, different um, organizations and, and countries have handled this. So if you could maybe speak to the international example. Um, Karen, I know that you're somebody who has thought a lot about this in, in working on the report and in open government. So would really be curious to hear your perspective about information and trust and how to, how to kind of hit the right note um, when, when talking to folks. Um, and Leslie, you've also you know, been in a room and had to, to present information to folks who have then deliberated. Um, so would be really keen to also hear your perspective as both a convener and presenter to these groups. Claudia, I'll hand it off to you first. Yeah, th thanks, Laurie. I mean, I think that's a really, really important question and it comes up a lot. And I think it's because it's also because it's really at the core of this as well, that you know, you're designing a process where you're giving people a lot of time, but also you're giving them a chance to explore quite a lot of information, to have access to a wide diversity of expertise. And I, I think here there's emphasis on and a few key aspects, two in particular. One is really the diversity. Um, I think, I mean, I don't think it's possible to really come across that loaded word balance. I think what is needed is really having the widest spectrum of diversity possible. Um, and I think this also involves giving the participants the, the chance to request additional information, to be asked, you know, what do you need to hear? What else do you need to understand to be able to start thinking about uh, recommendations together? Uh, and that's also why having enough time for such a process is important and why usually it's spread out over numerous weeks because that allows the organizers to then come back and provide that additional information. It allows people to really think about also individually what they've what they've heard about and what they've taken in. But the important thing is that everyone, everyone who's part of this process has actually been hearing from the same wide diversity of experts and of stakeholders. So it's quite different to our usual forms of participation where we're each getting information from our specific sources and we're not necessarily always hearing, hearing the same thing. Um, I think then the information also comes in different formats in, in this latest period when, when different uh, processes have been moved online as well. I think there's also been an experimentation with using more videos and more, uh, I mean, I, I think you could, Peter could probably speak more to, to the technical uh, aspects of the different ways in which you could design a session to share information too. But I think that principle of, of diversity and the wide breadth uh, and, and giving citizens ultimately the power to ask for more information are really key. And then also making all of that information transparently available to the wider public to generate their trust in the process is I think really important as well. Great, Karen, do you want to comment next? 
Sure, uh, absolutely, I'd love to. Um, so trust and information sharing and, and openness and transparency are kind of what we do every day, all day. Uh, so I love to talk about it <laughs> and uh, have lots of opinions on it. Um, what I would say at, for our process, such as what we're talking about here, we have found in the past that being authentic with what it is you can and cannot, you know, what is on the table, what is not on the table, what is the information that everybody feels they need to have an informed conversation and to, to deliberate. Um, information is power. So the more information you're able to give people, the more that they can understand the complexities as has been discussed already on this call and, and the trade-offs. Um, you need great facilitation. You need a good safe space for people to come together and convene and feel like they're being heard and that all voices have equal weight and that, uh, and, and facilitation is, is an art form. So you need to find someone who can really be empathetic and listen, but also help lead conversations without seeming like they're leading conversations because that would, you know, that hits the wrong note. Um, and I, I would say just from our experience with our multi-stakeholder forum that we've had since 2018, we were surprised, at, like the idea of civic literacy to me is something that I've been thinking a lot about over the summer and like over the last few years, but even when we convened this group of uh, civil society folks who do like advocate to the government and they, um, you know, they have a lot of opinions on the work that we're doing and they have a lot of input to provide they just basic things about parliamentary process about like the budget cycle about the sort of the rules the rules the rules we live under they were unfamiliar with that and so we had some friction the first i'm gonna say year and uh, then after that we really got this sense of like oh we need to go on a journey together a little bit and have some like share some information that we didn't even know we needed to share and they didn't really recognize that they needed to ask for so just kind of if it's something that's going to go on over time being open to really kind of seeing where where are the pain points and like what could maybe grease that a little bit so that you can have those so that they can say oh we need to think about this in like you know two to four year like an election time cycle sometimes so it's big and it takes time and the machinery of government is slow for lots of really good reasons so like how do you how do you work that into conversations you're having with people so that they can take that back to wherever it is they live and say like, well, the government is, you know, maybe they're doing their best sometimes because like there really are quite a lot of constraints. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that, but just like being honest and, and being open and saying when you don't know stuff, I think is all. Maybe I'll just add, add two, two last things. Um, uh, one, I think in terms of trust, um, it means that you yourself as an organization and yourself have to make yourself somewhat vulnerable. And um, it's interesting uh, for uh, our citizen uh, reference panels, um, we invite in some of our biggest critics to give their view of what we're doing or their view or a counter view. Um, and um, and that, has, uh, that actually builds trust with the group. You're willing to actually uh, sort of acknowledge that. I think the second thing, um, this is now, you know, almost like c community development and engagement one-on-one. -on -one you need to make the meeting itself a caring environment. So if you were entertaining people in your home, you would have tea and coffee and drinks. You would make the seats comfortable. You would have it in a wonderful space, not a basement, with natural light. You would um, demonstrate your hospitality and caring. And I think that's an aspect that also builds trust. Um, you know, if you went to a meeting every Saturday and, and you know, it was water and, and uh, you know, in a, in a horrible space where you couldn't hear the speaker, and he didn't care about how you get there. And so we offer to assist people to get, you know, in in and getting to our the locations, try to make the locations convenient. All these little little tiny things, which we need to be fussed over, are trust building elements. And so, therefore, I think that's an important aspect of it as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Leslie, Karen, and Claudia for those, those really thoughtful comments. Um, and I love the idea, Leslie, of, of like, be just your best dinner party host, right? It's, it's really good advice, I think, <laughs> um, that we should all probably just use, generally speaking, more, more frequently. 
Um, so we're coming up uh, just after 10 minutes on the hour. Um, and so I do want to, you know, extend a huge thank you to Claudia, to Karen, to Leslie, to Peter for joining us here today. Um, but also, you know, to all of you who have, you know, spent the hour or so with us. Um, and thanks for your interest in the topic. Thanks for joining us. Um, thank you for your excellent questions. It was tough to keep up and get them in. Um, but I, I hope I've done them justice. Um, I have two last housekeeping notes. Um, first is that if you're interested in continuing to learn, there have been a number of links and things sent in the chat box today. Um, so please continue learning that way. Um, there are also just a few other things that I want to point folks to. So one is just generally speaking, the OECD's Innovative Citizen Participation. Just Google it. They've got some really great stuff as well to check out. Um, there's also the uh, United Nations Democracy Fund, so the UNDF's Democracy Beyond Elections Handbook, um, which I would also recommend that people look up as well. Um, and uh, if anyone is interested in commissioning a Citizens Assembly, uh, there is a guide that you can read on the Mass LBP website. So I'd encourage folks to check that out. Um, and my second housekeeping note is that we're going to do um, a job, a good job of following up with you. So we're going to take all of the links and things that we've um, been seeing floating around in the chat box and we'll um, ping you guys an email by the end of the week so that you have that all consolidated in case you weren't able to keep up. Um, and we'll also circulate um, folks' emails, so the, the presenter's emails. So that way, if you do have any other questions or anything that you would like to follow up with after the call, I know some emails have been dropped into the group chat. Um, we'll consolidate that for you as well and send that out. Um, but once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we hope that you enjoyed our conversation. I know I certainly did and I really hope that everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks folks and, and take care. Thank you, Lori. Thanks Lori for, for hosting and moderating. No problem.